work that we have done and um, some of the work that um, that uh, we aim to do, uh, mostly proteome, uh, mass spectrometry uh, based proteomics. So uh, this would be proteomics approaches for COVID-19 diagnosis, prognosis, and uh, therapeutics. Um, I won't go into the enormity of the current situation, the current pandemic situation. And uh, since the dawn of the pandemic, our, um, our group uh, shifted gears to the COVID research with whatever resources we had to make the best use of them. And um, so uh, the mass spectrometry-based proteomics work, uh, the, what mostly we have done is uh, for in, in these three uh, uh, fields, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutics. Uh, let me start by talking about the prognosis and therapeutics part. So for, the, uh, uh, for that, the host proteomics for uh, COVID-19 uh, prognosis and therapeutics. We were uh, we were able to acquire uh, COVID nineteen uh, clinical samples from um, negative, non severe, and severe patients, and uh, that included. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the plasma and swab work that we have done, and which is uh, now published, and from. Uh, the host proteomics part, what we were able to infer uh, regarding uh, some biomarkers and um, identification of some therapeutic targets. And apart from that, the, uh, the proteome profile uh, that led to some uh, interesting pathways uh, that could help us understand the uh, pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 infection. Um, Talking about the plasma proteomics, so uh, the the deep proteome analysis of uh, patient plasma revealed some uh, interesting proteins that were uh, uh, differentially expressed in uh, COVID nineteen positive uh, patient as compared to the negative cohort, and these are the um, top uh, 27, the most significant uh, differentially expressed proteins. Uh, the, uh, this, the, the PLSDA um, graph here uh, of 71 patients shows a segregation between um, COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 negative cohorts uh, depending upon uh, the uh, proteome profile and here is a volcano plot showing the uh, significantly uh, significant differentially expressed proteins between uh, positive and negative cohorts. Uh, uh, also, uh, the proteome analysis of severe versus uh, non-severe COVID-19 patients led us to identifying some uh, proteins that were significantly uh, that were significantly upregulated or downregulated in severe patients as compared to uh, non-severe patients. And this is the heat, uh, heat map for same. Again, except for uh, one or two samples, uh, the two cohorts were um, separating, uh, as you can see in this PLSDA uh, clustering plot. Uh, depending, uh, so um, functional enrichment analysis of these uh, differentially expressed proteins uh, led us to identify some pathways that were um, dysregulated in um, severe patients. And for example, blood coagulation, complement system, uh, exocytosis, leukocyte activation, uh, peptide activities, the pathways involved in uh, uh, in, in these um, systems uh, also correlated with the clinical uh, symptoms of COVID patients. For example, um, the uh, coagulation related abnormalities in COVID patients and um, severe inflammation 
um, all these relate to uh, what we were, we observe um, from our functional enrichment analysis. Uh, based on the um, uh, based on the uh, proteins, the differentially expressed proteins that were that we were identifying in the plasma, uh, we did some uh, MRA assay for validation to um, you know uh, for the cl uh, clinical translation as uh, disease severity biomarkers and um, proteins like AGT. Um, that is angiotensinogen, EPOB, epilipoprotein B, serpin A3, fibrogen, uh, fibrogen gamma chain. These all showed, um, uh, these were uh, specifically, uh, they showed statistically significant overexpression in COVID-19 severe patients uh, than in non-severe patients. And um, a patent has been filed for uh, this work. Uh, coming to the swab proteomics, um, alteration of swab, swab proteome in response to COVID-19 uh, infection. These are some uh, of the proteins that, uh, that we found to be upregulated in, uh, in the swab of COVID patients. And uh, for example, uh, lactate dehydrogenase A, lactate dehydro uh, dehydrogenase B. STAT1 is a key regulator of uh, interleukin 6. And uh, as you might have heard, interleukin uh, cytokine uh, storm, um, which is like uh, heightened due to um, interleukins like uh, IL6, IL8. So this kind of correlates with those symptoms, then hemoglobin subunits A and B. Um, these are just some of the proteins uh, that were found to be differentially expressed in uh, positive swab samples. Further uh, functional enrichment analysis of differentially expressed proteins uh, led us to um, identify some pathways that were uh, dysregulated in um, COVID-19 patients. Uh, neutrophil de uh, degranulation, plated uh, degranulation, then uh, interleukin 12 mediated, uh, mediated signaling pathway and a uh, host translation mechanism. Again, these all um, correlate with the um, clinical uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and uh, deeper analysis would help us to uh, understand the disease pathophysiology better. Finally, uh, this um, the, the proteins that were statistically significant, uh, that was statistically, uh, statistically significant, that showed statistically uh, significant overexpression in uh, COVID-19 positive samples were validated using MRM assay and uh, these are the bars, uh, these are the graphs uh, uh, that, uh, as you can see in, uh, in positive samples, uh, these proteins, IL, IL6, uh, lactate dehydrogenase A, uh, aspartate amino transferase, C-reactive protein, which is uh, an acute phase protein indicating, um, um, indicating, uh, inflammation in the body. So um, again, a patent uh, has been filed for these proteins and they can act, they can, uh, act as uh, markers for prognosis of COVID-19 in um, individuals. Coming to the therapeutics part, the, the, the differentially expressed proteins identified from uh, these proteome uh, analysis uh, can lead to um, identification of some potent um, targets that can be um, um, some proteins that can be targeted for therapeutics. And um, so uh, we perform some molecular uh, docking experiments to identify if um, um, some 
clinical or preclinical drugs uh, could be found binding to these proteins. And um, through these experiments, some uh, FDA approved drugs and uh, some preclinical drugs, like uh, we could uh, streamline some uh, FDA approved and preclinical drugs, for example, uh, loratadine, uh, which is uh, it was found to bind to three major proteins from the interleukin pathway. Similarly, uh, uh, selenexor and conatinib, uh, which are approved for use in uh, myeloma and uh, leukemia, they were also found to, found to bind to proteins uh, altered in severe cases. Um, again, of course, these need to be validated in uh, cell culture and then animal-based uh, uh, models, but um, uh, this this can at least uh, help to streamline some drug candidates uh, to uh, that can be taken forward. So that's that's uh, the application of proteomics for therapeutics. Uh, coming to the diagnosis uh, part. Uh, this is for the detection of viral peptides from um, COVID-19 nasopharyngeal swab samples. Um, this is a workflow. So um, now the viral peptides, um, obviously the host peptides uh, outnumber the viral peptides in clinical samples. So uh, we tried some um, uh, different extraction uh, methods. Uh, for example, uh, we tried acetone, ethanol, and plus the isopropanol, and we compared the number of viral peptides uh, that we getting out of the three extraction methods. And depending on that, uh, we actually um, realized that pooling the three solvents gave the maximum number of uh, viral peptides. So. Um, Using, using this uh, method, we, uh, uh, we took forward the samples for processing and uh, MSMS analysis. And um, global proteomics um, uh, led us to identify some viral peptides that we further validated using uh, MRM assays. And uh, yeah, as we, this is the comparison of various extraction method that we use. And uh, as you can see, the pool gave a uh, maximum number of viral peptides. And distinct MRM spectra uh, was seen for some viral peptides in COVID samples, but not in clinical controls. And these are just three representative, uh, representative uh, spectra for three viral peptides. Um, uh, again, uh, this the patent has been filed for this work. And um, although this was uh, validated on a very really small number of patients um, from the previous wave uh, to uh, for really uh, for cl clinical translation of uh, MS-based diagnosis, this needs to be validated on a large number of cohort and uh, we are uh, working on that part. Um, in summary, uh, the host proteomics uh, allowed us for some biomarker discovery and we further validated uh, uh, the identified host proteins using um, MRM-based assays. Also, host proteomics allowed for um, uh, identification of some pathways that uh, that can help in better understanding of disease pathophysiology. Uh, target identification for therapeutics and uh, uh, viral peptide detection and validation for diagnosis. Um, these are the two papers uh, that are now published. Uh, one, this one is for plasma and this one is for swab proteomics. Uh, the all the proteomics uh, data, the plasma data sets, and 
so our data sets are uh, available at these um, at pride uh, this is the pride identifier and the targeted the targeted proteomics data is available at the given um, urls now um, what we are working on now is um, one mass spectrometry based detection of viral peptide as an alternate way of covid-19 and this is um, not just for research purpose uh, this is more for uh, translation purpose and uh, the increased false negative rate of uh, rt pcr test really call for alternate alternative uh, methods of diagnosis and like uh, we really hope if um, this mass spectrometry based detection of viral peptides could work out for um, for uh, diagnosis uh, for for that um, um, we um, the pep query workflow for uh, identification of viral peptides um, this workflow was shared by uh, dr pratik and we had tried this workflow and identified some peptides now uh, the workflow used um, some um, most probable uh, covid 19 peptides uh, that were determined um, uh, experimentally so um, using this we were able to identify some peptides in our swab data sets uh, from the previous wave and we are also trying uh, that on uh, from uh, on samples from the current wave and we were uh, further we validated uh, those peptides using PRL assay and uh, I'm showing this for uh, two peptides although like we were able to um, detect around 10 peptides uh, so these are the uh, results that we got through our PRL assays the, the challenge here is that uh, we we were also uh, seeing these peptides in some um, RT-PCR negative uh, negative samples, uh, but also to keep in mind that those uh, negative samples were from recovered patients. So there is always a possibility of detecting viral peptides in patients who have already recovered from COVID nineteen. But uh, this uh, these results give a little hope that uh, this could work out uh, as we were. Uh, another project that we are working on um, is the proteo uh, metaproteomic analysis of COVID-19 swab samples. Um, there is mounting evidence um, to suggest that viral respiratory infections and COVID for that matter predispose patients to various bacterial and fungal infections. And in COVID-19, there is very uh, there is a higher rate of uh, bacterial co-infections, uh, especially in patients with severe infections, and that leads to worse outcomes. So, um, and with the reports of um, a fungal infection, the uh, black fungus causing mucor uh, mucor mycosis. Um, is uh, is alarming and uh, a metaproteomic analysis of uh, these swab samples could uh, if that could uh, help to identify uh, some uh, if that could help to indicate the possibility of co-infections and could uh, help in management of COVID-19 uh, that would be uh, something to look forward to. So for this project, um, the Galaxy P team, uh, Dr. Pratik, they're helping us with the analysis. Um, and lastly, 
something that we are exploring is MS based uh, detection of mutant peptides in viral streams. Um, for that, uh, we're generating a protein uh, database using publicly available uh, genome sequencing. So this G uh, GSAD is a publicly available uh, repository for the genomic data of SARS-CoV-2. And all the variants of the virus, the genomic sequence for all the variants of the virus uh, is available uh, at this site. So uh, using, um, using these genomic sequences, uh, we are trying to generate a protein uh, database that would have protein sequences for all the uh, variants and analysis of our um, data sets against this comprehensive uh, database can um, could lead to identification of um, new peptides and um, possibly some uh, mutations in those peptides. So far, um, we did uh, we did run some uh, samples from 2020 against the database that we have created, and the viral out of around 100 viral peptides that we were getting um, after blast analysis, we found that some were uh, blast analysis against the um, reference Wuhan um, strain. Uh, we um, we saw that some mutations uh, were showing up and uh, the next thing would be to validate these peptides in uh, using uh, targeted approaches. So um, the work, all the work, the credit for all the work goes to the entire team and um, the clinicians that we are working with and of course um, Professor Sanjeeva Shrivastha. Um, also, uh, I would like to thank Galaxy P, uh, Dr. Pratik and his entire team for helping us out with uh, data analysis uh, part. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, uh, Survi, for an excellent um, talk, kind of summarizing some of the work that was done, you know, in, you know, in, in the publications that you mentioned and the future work that you're doing. Um, I'll let uh, others, if they have any questions uh, about this talk, I have a few questions, but I'll let others um, ask a question, if any. <clears throat> Tim, I can ask a question. Sure. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was really, <clears throat> really well done. I'm just curious, as you look at the mutant strains, it looks like you've done some analysis on where some of the mutations might show up. Are you, is it in the spike protein mostly that those, those, these mutant strains are going to show changes or, or are there certain other proteins that you would predict or where? where these changes will show up? Um, uh, so your voice was breaking actually, but from what I understood, are you trying to ask whether the mutations were in spike protein, right? Yeah, uh, right, sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah, so just curious if there's um, any specific proteins in the uh, virus that that are sort of mostly, where the mutations are aggregated, I guess. Mostly from what we could detect, it was uh, replicase poly, uh, polyprotein 1AB. And one or two peptides were from spike and uh, nucleocapsid as well, but mostly were from uh, replicase polyprotein 1AB. And also I think uh, given it's a very large protein. Um, more proteins, uh, like more mutations are expected from that uh, polyprotein protein. Okay, thank you.
Um, Turbi, I had a question about, <clears throat> so you uh, performed, I mean, you have manuscripts on uh, plasma proteomics as well as swab samples. Um, and you've done, you know, pathway analysis and looking for which proteins seem to be upregulated in, you know, both these conditions, host proteins, especially. Um, do you see a kind of difference? I mean, do you see any proteins that are common to these two? And then uh, what are the differences and commonalities in the proteins that you see in these two conditions? Uh, from these two samples, I mean. I think the commonalities would be the pathways uh, that, are detect that are getting detected after functional enrichment analysis. Uh, like uh, the, if you noticed, uh, one in in swab, uh, it was coming out uh, platelet degranulation and neutrophil degranulation, and the same uh, was in plasma as well. Uh, regular exocytosis, uh, if you think about it, degranulation is sort of exocytosis. So yeah, some pathways that were involved in the immune response and complement uh, complement system, then. Um, uh, acute phase proteins um, that these are the proteins that are upregulated or downregulated during uh, inflammation. Uh, they were coming common in swab and uh, plasma. So, I mean, in terms of clinical application, would you uh, then suggest taking nasal swabs, which are because which are kind of easier to you know acquire as compared to plasma samples? And then if you see something alarming, ask them to do plasma analysis, uh, just as a confirmation, is that the path that you, uh, you know, you would suggest if this was used for clinical application? I mean, yeah, that can be done, but depending upon uh, the, the severity, I mean, depending upon why the plasma, um, okay, that's a good question. And I think um, this, we can think more about it. But if uh, we are getting more information out of plasma proteomics, uh, then um, after uh, analysis on swab plasma can be looked after. So yeah, that's that. Um, and then it's, uh, if there are any more questions, please, you know, go ahead and ask them. I have another one, the interesting part about the uh, RT-PCR negative samples, and then you see those peptides present, um, especially even after uh, COVID patients have recovered from the samples. I mean, there have been reports that the, uh, you know, you might even get RT-PCR positive test, even if you, you know, yeah. if you get, uh, the, I mean, the severity might go down, your uh, cycles might, you know, go down, but it, it might still uh, kind of lurk around. Um, so is there, um, I mean, the, the fact that you're actually seeing some peptides in COVID-19 uh, recovered patients um, and who are supposed to be an RT-PCR negative or at least have a very low uh, load of viruses. Um, is that some kind of a, I mean, isn't that a little bit of a concern? And how long is it known that the viruses would stay in the, um, you know, in the body until you know, until they are kind of cleared out. Is there some some research that's done not in your lab, but in, in literature in general? Um, I no, I I don't think I have uh, done that kind of um, review to look at for how long uh, the virus stays inside the body. But if we are seeing in uh, we are seeing viral peptides in recovered patients, then then uh, there. I mean, there is a possibility that the virus, or if not virus, at least the parts of the virus, the peptides are uh, in the system. And then you also, did you, in your analysis, either in the, mostly in the new samples, because there are new strains that are, or at least a new strain that was uh, <clears throat> prevalent in, uh, in the second wave, did you see, uh, RT-PCR negative samples, and then when you looked at the mass spectrometry, either through the PRM approach or through uh, the, the workflow that you mentioned, uh, did you find any peptides, COVID-19 peptides in those 
So you in, um, uh, in 2021 samples? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the data, the PRM uh, data that I showed were for 2021 samples. Okay. Yeah, and these are all RT-PCR negative uh, samples or most of them were? No, uh, they are positive as well as negative samples and we are detecting the peptides in all of them. All of them. And the patients had some symptoms, even if they're RT-PCR negative. Is that right? So they are recovered patient, as in they were infected. Okay. They recovered. Then there was this, the, the test to, uh, you know, say that they are recovered. And so here, like, if uh, once you get a negative RT-PCR, then only you're discharged from the hospital. So Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I asked that question because uh, I know there are quite a few cases wherein uh, the RT-PCR tests keep, keep coming negative and, you know, a patient has yeah, that's also symptoms. Okay. Huh. Yeah. And then if you take a nasal swab from these patients, do you see those peptides while, you know, just because of the, maybe the primers not working for the new strain or some other technical difficulties during RT-PCR? Um, I wonder if you have any samples like those. Um, or have looked into some, any of those samples. I mean, what I'm trying to say is, does mass spectrometry sometimes give you uh, a complementary method and sometimes even an advantage over RT-PCR um, to detect any of the COVID-19 peptides? Have you seen any such cases? I'm not clear, what, what are you asking? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you have a COVID-19 patient, right, uh, in the sense, and most of the times they are subjected to RT-PCR analysis by taking nasal swabs, right? And they show symptoms and they have, you know, all the symptoms like lack of taste and lack of smell and all of those things and fever and other things. But they still sometimes, there are questions, at least in, I've heard few cases and correct me if I'm wrong because uh, you, you might have a better uh, understanding of the situation that the RT-PCR tests seem to come out negative because of, you know, yes the primers not being properly optimized or various reasons maybe it's a new strain um have you do you have an access to such samples and have you looked at uh, you know taken those samples and looked for peptides that are present the question being you know does mass spectrometry kind of detect these peptides even if it's rt pcr negative result uh, so I, I i don't think we have that information to be um, you know more precise that whether the rt pcr negative actually um, for showing symptoms or not mm -hmm. uh, means we have uh, what what are classified as rt pcr positive and rt pcr negative okay so um yeah, I, I mean, I say that because it's very critical for the medication to be given at the right time, uh, you know, to be diagnosed. And I know that, uh, I mean, again, knowing from some of the uh, people I've talked to, that nowadays symptoms are given a lot more importance rather than, you know, waiting for the yes. RT-PCR test, because you really want to be sure that you're given the right medication at the right stage of the, uh, you know, of, of the disease. Um, but we're just curious in terms of um, whether that's, uh, something that so could be that's used. true uh, the false negative rate for uh, rt pcr is high and that is why um, other clinical other tests um, the ct scan the um, d dimer levels and all that these tests are suggested to right. confirm if the right. symptoms are there right um yeah i have a question about mucor mycosis but i don't know if there are any other questions from anybody else Okay, in terms of mucor mycosis, um, is is this something that happens only in patients who are hospitalized, or is this something that happens when even if you are home quarantined? Do you know anything about this? Um, I, I think I did not uh, look into that. Okay, Whether I mean, the question being, is it the hospital equipment that is, or the hospital environment which is also causing this? The question is, is it hospital act, uh, acquired or? Yeah, I know it's something to do with immunosuppression because there are steroids which kind of immunosuppress the patient. And yes, can, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, those uh, I have heard. Um, Sai Chiran is saying that reports suggest only in hospitals so far. 
Uh, but then it, it is an opportunistic uh, fungus and uh, the steroids and the immune system of the patient is um, not uh, capable to fight it back probably. So it is. All right. I think it is an opportunistic bacteria. Uh, it, it must be, it can, uh, it, it is not just limited. It should not just be limited to a hospital is what my thought is. Um, I, I, I don't know what it was to say. All right. Um, any other questions? All right, if not, uh, thank you very much, Survi, uh, uh, for your work, your lab's work. And uh, I, I'm hoping that the numbers at the peak uh, that you, you know, that uh, India is facing right now is starts coming down. And, um, but, uh, you know, thanks very much for your work and uh, yeah, stay safe and uh, hopefully things will come back to the new normal. So thanks for all the work. Thank you. Thank you. Um...